Oh, there you are. You there? Yes. Okay. I guess something happened to the camera for a minute. Hmm. Okay. Strange. Yeah, but you know, you're back. You look great. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Yeah, so this uh, interview will have two parts now. Part there. two. <laughs> we Possibly more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had some funky uh, purple effects, whatever that is. <laughs> I liked it. You know, purple is one of my favorite colors. So uh, yeah, it was nice, nice little break there. There you uh, go. So what were we, what were we, what were we talking about? Oh, now you're you're gonna ask me the tough questions. Yeah. Um, no, I th- we were we talked about uh, uh, how you were writing text before you got into podcasting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you asked me how long that was. Yeah. yeah. And it was about two or three years. Um, That's a long time. A lot of movies. A lot of movies, especially early on, and and we kind of teased this uh, earlier when we were talking about uh, Lynn Shelton's films. In the early days, I was getting kind of very little sleep, and I actually ended up going to seek some medical treatment of it after a couple of years because mm-hmm. I would um, literally, you know, I, I had a brief radio gig out in the suburbs, and I would drive there, and I would, like, nod off in the car. Not like my wow. head would fall asleep, but my brain would start to go into a sleep state while I'm just mm. driving. It's like car. insomnia uh, so, or narcolepsy. It's sort of. Like, yeah. I always imagine narcolepsy was like, you're standing all of a sudden you fall down, but it mm. turns out that your brain can actually start shutting down. Like I could be having a conversation with you and yeah. you know, the, the stuff behind my brain is like, it's time to go to sleep and I have yeah, no yeah. control over it. So I'm driving and all of a sudden I feel like I'm dreaming about my hands being on the steering wheel, but even yeah. worse than that, I feel like I'm dreaming about watching a movie about my hands being on the steering wheel. Yeah, that that definitely sounds like narcolepsy. My girlfriend has it, and uh, yeah, she with the meds, it's very controllable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I ended up getting uh, on some. Uh, I got it like a CPAP machine and and some drugs to help me sleep at night. Uh, you know, it's it's all better now. You know, I've been awesome. Uh, pretty good for a few years but the moral or the point of that story is there are whole stretches whole movies that i am sure that i watched and reviewed that you know Mm -hmm. someone will ask me about oh did you see this and i'll have to go back and be like i don't think i watched oh my god i i watched (laughs) it and i wrote a thousand words on it (laughs) right that's amazing (laughs) what did i think um but yeah so there's a and before I had children, you know, there was about probably a year when I first started this site before I had my first kid, I mm-hmm. was watching and reviewing like three to five movies a week. Um, oh, okay. You know, That's a like lot. 800 to 1,000 word reviews and just like banging them out and all that stuff. Uh, Amazing. It's definitely s- slowed down. Um, and then I transitioned to podcasting sort of out of interest, but also out of uh, laziness. Mm-hmm. Because I, I landed an interview with two filmmakers. It was like a 45-minute or an hour-long conversation that I didn't want to just transcribe into written words. So I'm like, well, I recorded it. How do I get this out there? And I did some quick research, and much like the birth of the regular website, you know, like a week later I had uh, a podcast. And Awesome. That has grown to, you know, I'm going to post my 540th episode later this week. That's a lot. And at that time, podcasting was becoming more uh, well-known and more popular. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Got it. Um, and so the nice thing about that is that there's a lot of, you know, tutorials and information about how to how to get it going. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's not I wasn't just doing it in a vacuum. Yeah. Now everyone has to have a podcast by law. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and it's. Not only that, I, there there really is something to that because everybody has – everyone and their brother has a podcast, uh, but it's so easy now. You know, you can do mm-hmm. the entire thing from your phone. I mean, now the big thing is YouTube, which you can literally do an entire YouTube production from your smartphone. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing time. I yeah. read that uh, 30,000 YouTube videos are uploaded every hour. That seems like a slow YouTube day to me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. In, co- in comparison, uh, Hollywood releases maybe 600 movies a year. Uh, that was true up until a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah, now now zero. Now it's shut down. There were zero or very few. But yeah, uh, yeah. so that's interesting that uh, web video has become the primary entertainment production in America and elsewhere. Yeah, the the thing that's also interesting to me is that 
you know, at least the way I interact with, with YouTube videos and things is I still treat them like podcasts or like mm-hmm. people would treat like radio. You know, I put mm-hmm. it on and I put it in my back pocket while I'm washing dishes or, you know, running errands or something. I'm listening to it. I'm not sitting there watching Joe Rogan talk to someone for three hours. I'm listening to it and, and, mm-hmm. and in mm-hmm. chunks, that kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a weird situation. Yeah, that's for podcasts, but uh, more visual based things like short films and documentaries and longer films, those are also there, also on there. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you know, and I think YouTube is is great for that. Um, I don't know. I I wonder, like, with all of that glut of content, like how anybody breaks through. I mean, you don't necessarily you hear about YouTube influencers and things like that, but like breakout stars, you don't hear those quite those many stories now as you did, you know, ten years ago. Back in the day, the wild, yeah. wild west and a young platform for sure. Yeah, well, I think that's the difference between Hollywood and YouTube. In Hollywood, they put millions of dollars into promoting one movie for a number of months, so that becomes well known, gets into the national and international conscious consciousness. Uh, uh, YouTube, I think, uh, if you have a hundred thousand followers, you're probably a star. Uh, yeah, there's something. There's definitely something to that. Um, there's also the the frequency that you you know of putting out content and and promoting it and stuff, like appearing in other people's you know YouTube videos or something mm-hmm. to talk about your movie or or whatever. Um, it's it's very cool. I I do like the the democratization of it. And now with the whole COVID nineteen situation. It's interesting seeing those big Hollywood studios really having to compete. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you've got movies that were slated for major, you know, theatrical releases now getting dumped. It's a harsh term, but it's kind of mm-hmm. true. Directly mm-hmm. onto, you know, Amazon or or YouTube, yeah. you can rent these things for yeah. ten or twenty bucks. But you really have to. You're competing with a million things that are free or far mm-hmm. less expensive. Like, mm-hmm. you know, an indie filmmaker can put their movie out for three dollars. Like, I'll yep. watch that. It's something mm-hmm. interesting to engage in rather than, you know, oh look, the new Scooby Doo movie is out. <laughs> That's right. It's ten bucks. I don't know if I want to take that risk. Yeah. No. As I was uh, discussing with the mirror in a recent podcast, Hollywood had to uh, has to now embrace how indie filmmakers have always had to release movies recently which is uh, Amazon Prime, Vimeo, other web-based distribution outlets. Yeah, uh, they don't have that guaranteed, like, upfront, you know, we'll take in our $100 million and then eventually yes. we'll make some more money off the back end. Everything's the back end now. Mm-hmm. When, do you think, uh, when do you think theaters will come back? <sighs> I don't if know. If ever. I, I think they'll, they'll come back in some capacity. I don't know that they'll be as many of them necessarily because as much as there's been talk about you know well is amazon going to buy amc or something like that yeah i if, heard about that if amc still exists and they have to do something where it's like 25 percent or 75 or 50 percent capacity seating like you can have one person or two people every four seats like if you and a date come in then you mm-hmm. have to have four seats around you mm-hmm. you can't that's not a good business model, so I don't know how yeah. long that's going to survive. I imagine there'll be like a boutique theater situation. Um, you know, maybe it'll be like a night at the opera or something where it's like fifty dollars to see <laughs> a mm-hmm. three-hour movie. Um, I, I don't know. I, I hope that it doesn't go away, but realistically, depending on how this whole virus thing shakes out, and more important, the social attitudes towards large gatherings, because outside of movies, you got concerts and yeah. casinos and sporting mm-hmm. events and all this other stuff that has to be reworked. So I just don't know. I would like things to get back to some semblance of what they were before, but I do also like the, the idea that this has forced us to stop and think about, does this make sense? Is there a way that, you know, can, can we do... St- can we do things differently? Mm-hmm. I think uh, once we have a vaccine, maybe in two years, movie theaters will come back to normal. I just can't imagine going into a movie theater, even with spaced out seating, hanging out in there for two hours while someone else might be breathing into air, into the air, the COVID-19, right? So well, I think I, two years. It's not going to be two years because if you look at the situation right now where you've got some states that have reopened, you know, mm-hmm. Wisconsin just, you know, opened up uh, their bars and restaurants and they're packed. There's mm-hmm. places that have beaches that are they're overflowing. Um, 
I mean, yeah, you're going to see the you know resurgence possibly in, in numbers and things, but I think there's just an attitude that people are like, we've done this for two months. If you guys want to stay inside, that's yeah. cool. We're going to go out and do our thing. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be businesses that are going to accommodate that. So mm -hmm. it might even be a regional thing, like, mm -hmm. you know, in Tennessee or something or, or South Dakota where they never really shut down. They might have, yeah, we'll still have our AMC or our Regal or something. All cinemas will still be packed. It's just you won't be able to go to the movies in New York. So going yeah, to see yeah, a movie, I'll, a theatrical experience will involve a road trip. <laughs> that's something. right. Or I'll, I, I, I'll wait until we have a vaccine. I don't, I don't want to hang out inside a movie theater for two hours. Well, well, until I'll, 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 I'll text you back and let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let's see what happens. No one knows, but I mean, uh, watching uh, movies from home is fine. Uh, if 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 I have to risk uh, my health, I can I can wait. I've yeah. seen enough movies in movie theaters. Yeah, I, I haven't. I mean, I think there's still uh, like I'm I'm anxious for the music box to open up because there's something about like the independent, you know, classic movie palace kind of an experience. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just going to be weird. I don't know. I know they will survive somehow because they're an institution that's survived, you know, <laughs> wars and things like that and depressions right. and economic downturns. I just don't know what it's going to be like. Um, as far as the mainstream mall, you know, big chain theater, uh, I don't know. But I'm anxious well, to get back into some kind of a theatrical setting because I like being around people. I like the culture and all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. You go? Don't... Do you go to a lot of uh, uh, re uh, critic screenings? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a great way for you to watch because it's not a lot, a lot of people at those no, screenings. No, it is, I, and that's the thing. Critic screenings are two kinds. There's the mm -hmm. really intimate ones that like the Lake Street screening room, where it's only film critics, and sometimes yeah. you have 13 people, sometimes you have 50. That's what well, I was talking about. Right, but most critic screenings are what I call the contest winner screenings where mm -hmm. you've got, you know, they're showing the movie a few days before release. They've got like, Hey, you won this internet contest. So you and your friend get to come see this movie early. Mm -hmm. They put the critics, they rope off like two or three rows in like, the AMC downtown for us to sit with, mm -hmm. you know, a packed theater. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's probably better for them because then the critics get to hear the audience response. Yeah, and also they don't have to book, you know, a separate. Uh, a separate. Sometimes they'll they'll do that depending on what the movie is, but yeah, a lot of times, also depending on what the film is, if they think it's going to be, you know, a stinker, mm -hmm. they're not going to go through the <laughs> expense of like, <laughs> hey, we're going to show this twice to people and hope they show up. There we go. Well, let's see what happens. We will know, but hopefully there'll be a vaccine soon. So, go ahead. No, yes, yeah, I'm. I'm hoping that there'll be a vaccine or sufficient herd immunity or, or whatever that this, mm -hmm. uh, that people will get this under control. Um, I just hope there's some kind of a, a broader social solution because this as bad as COVID-19 is, it's not nearly as bad as it was projected to be. And well, you know, probably because we took the steps to avert it from being bad. Yeah. It depends on who you talk to. I mean, that's the thing. Some in New people, York, we could definitely say that uh, those steps helped. Well, sure. I mean, that's the the thing, though. There are places that never shut down that mm -hmm. have, you know, and you, you got to talk. It's an entire conversation about population density and, and what measures they took beyond lockdowns. You know, just mm -hmm. we never shut down, but we also heavily encouraged social distancing. And because social distancing and masks and all that became kind of a cultural phenomenon, people took steps and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about is... This is not the, you know, resurgence of the 1918 flu that everyone thought it was going to be. Uh, but that by all, you know, by sheer numbers, it's coming. And I don't know that every year that something breaks out that we can shut down the global economy and risk being plummeted into a depression, you know, because one of these years, the big bad is probably going to, you know, come and get us. Uh, we need to be prepared and have plans in place for dealing mm -hmm. with that, you know, gradually. Right. Because uh, what's going on right now is not going to work, <laughs> frankly. I understand yeah, well, because it's unprecedented in a lot of people's yeah, lifetimes. Yeah. But, you know, something people just need to be able to get on the same page. There needs to be some kind of like leadership. And I think this yeah, is a big was a failure of leadership. for it. Yes, on, on a number of different fronts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh had uh, the previous administration been in power, they might have handled things differently. 
uh, you know, I, I'm not willing to go there. I mean, we probably have different views on that, which we don't necessarily need to get into. But, you know, I'm not looking at the United States as the big bad in all of this. Um, no, I'm not saying that. Right. So given the timelines that I've looked at, I mean, I was following this story since like late last year. Yeah, so, so was I. I know. Right. And so I know the timelines mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you do, too. So if we want to get into a political discussion, we can. But, you know, if everyone wants to start pointing fingers at what the administration did, my question would be, why was it, why were there so many dismissive pieces about COVID-19 severity and preparation mm -hmm. in January? People are just like, why didn't we prepare in January? Like, well, why weren't you ringing the, the alarm bells in January when you were writing pieces mocking people as being conspiracy theorists or worry warts or all this other stuff when, you know, Donald Trump, for all of his faults, was starting task forces and things like that. So, but that's. Yeah, well, he also, he also, uh, well, we'll move on to other stuff. He also uh, disassembled a task force. And he wasn't taking he wasn't well, taking it seriously. But did, he did not disassemble the task force. That was a matter of folding a group into another group, which is kind of a corporate maneuver. But mm -hmm. yeah, I've heard that story too. But I looked into it, and it's not like one person got fired or their job got reassembled into a larger superstructure. So I mean, that's mm -hmm. it's an unfair characterization. But mm. we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, you know, people have different takes on it. I personally don't think uh, the federal government did a good job. But it did take a long time for even uh, the New York governor and New York mayor to realize it was worse. It was a worse problem than they expected. Sure, yeah. Because uh, early on uh, in February, uh, they were saying, yeah, go out. Don't wear a mask. Don't worry about it. No, we're not going to get it. And then by the end of the month, we had like a thousand people sick. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and I think the, the one, you know, what we're talking about here as hard a lesson as all of this is to learn, people hopefully are paying attention. And so the next time something like this happens, we're not going to have those, <laughs> those yeah. kinds of issues. We're, so hopefully someone's taking notes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, uh, I mean, if this was an actual biological attack, you know, it's over. It would have been game over because, the you know, the government just wasn't ready at, at any level to deal with something like this. Yeah. All right. So. How does your day job fit into what you do? How does my day job fit into what I do? Um, it supports it supports your life. Yeah, and that's <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do try and I do try and keep those things uh, separate. You know, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, what do you, what do you do as your day job? So for for people to know. Oh, um, I work at a company called Scientific Games, and uh, you know, currently I'm a producer. Uh, I started off, you know, I've been there for, this is my 22nd year there. I pretty much started the year after I graduated art school. I started, you know, mm -hmm. this company as an That's artist. That's a long time. It is. It's very yeah. long. Um, and, you know, over the course of my career there, I kind of evolved from being an artist to uh, someone who was uh, an art lead, you know, kind of managing a team of artists and then becoming a producer um, of a team and just evolving from there. So my job has really changed. I don't I'm not really art involved anymore. I'm more art adjacent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm helping to, you know, support global development teams for a awesome. gaming company. Yeah. So we make like slot machines and lottery tickets and things like that. So um, awesome. Get yourself a, get yourself a winning ticket. Well, that's the, that's <laughs> one of the one of the big impacts of this whole thing is, you know, much like movie theaters and sporting arenas, you know, casinos all over the world are you know not operating right now. Yeah, so yeah that's a problem. It's a, it's kind of a sticky situation. Um, but, you know, got to have optimism. But uh, um, Las Vegas was trying to reopen, right? I haven't uh, I haven't heard anything about Vegas. Um, oh, okay. I probably should pay more you attention probably should to that. Look but, into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, it's it's interesting because, you know, even though I'm not doing art really much uh, for the company uh, anymore and far less of it in my personal life than I am like doing movie criticism, mm -hmm. uh, in transitioning to that producer role, it really forced me out of my comfort zone. So mm -hmm. I'm interacting with, you know, different teams, different disciplines like producers and game designers, mathematicians and people in other countries and, you know, outside contractors and that kind of stuff. Which, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I didn't want to go to film school is because, you know, I'm kind of, you know. Dealing with a lot of people. Yeah, I'm not an introvert, but I'm also, you know, kind of shy. So 
getting out of my comfort zone helped when I decided to like become a podcaster or, you know, do interviews with, you know, filmmakers and, mm -hmm. and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, so it's been a, a huge benefit to me in that regard. And a think, growing process. Yeah. And also in having to manage, you know, doing two to three podcasts a week and all the other, you know, creative endeavors I'm involved in, I've had to get very organized, which in turn has helped my day job, you know, awesome. all about all about the spreadsheets and the, and the <laughs> Microsoft Outlook calendars. Well, well organized. Uh, how has this crisis uh, forced you towards trying to monetize what you do with the film criticism? Uh, it has not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it I, made you think about it, maybe. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, honestly, you're kind of a, a big component of that, because uh, I know you would you've been pushing the idea of like, hey, you should get on Patreon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually set up a Patreon account last week. I haven't awesome. done anything with it because I'm also, in addition to producing shows, I'm overhauling the website, which I've been trying to do for a couple of months. And one of the nice things about, well, the only nice thing about being furloughed right now is I've got more time to devote to those kind of creative things um, awesome. instead of doing the working from home deal. Um, but as far as monetizing, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I've always put that to the back of my head because as you mentioned, I've got something, a day job to support mm -hmm. these endeavors. So I've never really needed it, but now I'm thinking, well, everything on the landscape is uncertain now. So yeah. what, <laughs> what would monetization even look like mm -hmm. uh, for as long as I've been doing this? Uh, you know, the sad reality uh, for me is that I'm still, you know, I, I don't, I, I have a very small but dedicated uh, group of mm -hmm. listeners and, and viewers is how I'll put it. Um, plus there's all this competition and everything. So I wonder like, hey, if I'm going to charge like five bucks a month or if you want to donate to me, I can imagine people, well, who the hell are you? <laughs> so I, I well, I know. mean, that's a, yeah, that's a entirely, uh, that's an entire podcast on that subject. But I have seen lots of small creators uh, putting, getting donations, getting uh, Patreons going, selling merchandise, doing crowdfunding. And uh, even if you get, make a few hundred a, a month, uh, in the course of a year, that'll add up. I would love to make a few hundred a month doing that. <laughs> there you <laughs> no. go. Well, <laughs> if I find some useful articles, I'll send them your way. How to get started with monetizing uh, maybe a film uh, blog or a film review show. Yeah, and you know, I know other people who have done it. There are certain like podcasting services that hook you up with sponsors and things, and mm -hmm. I've kind of dabbled about with that. But a lot of that has come down to I'll look into something, and it could be a technical thing, like yeah. after, you know, post your RSS feed or something. I go look for that, and it's the wrong thing, and I'm spent an hour doing something. Like, okay, <laughs> I have to put this aside and go do like 50 other things, and I never That's get back right. to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe maybe during this downtime period, uh, that's something for you to look into. That might, be inter that might be interesting. Yeah. Um, so tell us about, you're an official Chicago film critic, member of the Film Critics Association or Society? Yeah. Uh, Chicago Film Critics Association. There yep. you go. And, CFCA. Uh, CFCA. And uh, that's a few, uh, a small number of people. Uh, tell, tell us about the struggle of getting into that association. Uh <laughs> The struggle is mostly psychological. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that is still a struggle. Yes. And, um, and and as they say in Islam, the inner war is also important. I like that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know about the the jihad, inner and outer idea in in Islam, right? No, I've only heard about jihad and the you know, outer. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. yeah. From the beginning, they taught in Islam. I mean, I'm not an expert on Islam, but this is just what I've read. That, uh, you know, warring against your enemies is good for the when necessary for the sake of the religion, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But the bigger struggle is the struggle inside the internal jihad, which is, uh, you know, uh, getting yourself under control according to their guidelines, connecting properly with God, et cetera, et cetera. So the but the point is the inner struggle is also a struggle. No, that, that's beautiful. And I was mentioning it kind of as a joke because. You know, actually getting into the CFCA, and I don't think I'm telling any tales out of school, was a mm -hmm. lot easier than I thought it was. And awesome. I, 
<laughs> and I, and that's not to say, you know, hey, they're, the doors are wide open. Anyone can just stroll <laughs> right in. I, th- that's right. I think it was uh, a combination of, of, of luck and, and, and talent or whatever they saw in me um, to join the organization. But, um, you know, it was, I, I became a member in 2013. And I think it was in 2011, I'd applied for the Online Film Critics Society and mm-hmm. I got rejected. And so I applied in 2012. And I got rejected. And I applied in 2013. Guess what? I got rejected. So, Did they give you a reason? Um, yeah, it was. Uh, and I'm going to be very careful here because I know there are even some of my colleagues uh, are members of the Online Film Critics Association. So I don't mean to, to trash anybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it's not even a matter of trashing. I got some feedback about what the not the reasons, but just some of the notes that the people who reviewed my stuff, you know, the, the one that sticks out is blog level writing at best. was how they <laughs> it, it put it. And you know, it. Look, looking back on some of my old reviews, that's not an unfair criticism. Um, <laughs> that, they, you should make a t-shirt. That's the t-shirt. That's the product item. <laughs> product item. With, uh, you know, kicking the same podcast in quotes, <laughs> blog level writing at best. Uh, from uh, from rejection letter to from uh, online film critic society or whatever. I like that. If if not, I'll, if nothing else, I'll put on a business card. But, there you um, go. <laughs> no. So and what in, does that even what does that even mean? Blog level bus- writing at best. I don't know. Uh, but again, this was also during the period that I was half awake, um, right. so I can understand. But no, in 2013, if I'm getting my timeline right, they, they had this thing where if you applied for you know a certain number of years in a row, you had to actually wait a year before reapplying again. Wow. Mm. Um, and so that was my year. I'm like, well, shit, I don't know. <laughs> what am I even doing? And um, why, it, why was it important for you to get into that, try to get into that organization? It was, you know, I don't know that it was important. It was more a matter of, you know, I guess legitimacy. Like, sure. could I do it? You know, yeah, and yeah. Makes also sense. a matter of like uh, contacts. And I would heard that you can get like screeners from studios and, you know, admission into like press screenings and things like that. So mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, just give it a shot because I've been yeah, doing yeah. it for a couple of years at that point. I'm like, well, you know, am I a film critic? Sure. Mm-hmm. Does that mean anything when everybody's a film critic on the internet? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you wanted to you wanted to differentiate yourself, or just yeah, just you know see what see what it'd be like. Yeah. Um, could I get in? And I couldn't. Um, but at that point, I had begun uh, establishing a relationship with the Music Box Theater, oh, um, good. which is like my childhood uh, art house theater. So the idea that I could get into you know, some screenings and stuff was very exciting. And my first screening uh, for a a film that was premiering there was for a movie called Room 237, which is a Mm -hmm. great documentary about conspiracy theories related to the movie The Shining. Okay, Uh, yeah. yeah. I remember hearing about it. Oh, if you've never seen it, you should definitely check it out. Um, Will do. It's it's beautifully done, and it's one of those things where a lot of the theories are so whacked out, but the people who believe in them – makes such a compelling case that you almost just wish you could resurrect <laughs> Stanley Kubrick and be like, yeah, what's this up is with true. That? Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so I got invited to the Lake Street screening room and that was my first, you know, critic screening really. Mm-hmm. And I met Dan Geyer, who was the president of the time at the time of the Chicago Film Critics Association. Awesome. He, he introduced himself to me and he sat down and we talked because I got there like 45 minutes early because you know, I didn't want to just to be screw ready. Up. Right. right. Um, and so he came and talked to me. And I think it was because I was the one person in the room. He didn't <laughs> recognize like, who is this kid? Um, but it was, you know, a, a great conversation. And he asked me about, you know, who, who I wrote for. And I told him and he said, well, you know, I think, you know, it'd be cool if you applied, you know, for the CFCA. And I, at that point, I think the rejection from OFCS mm-hmm. had been fresh in my mind. I'm like, okay, Chicago Film Critics Association is talking like, you know, Roger Ebert was a member and Richard Roper's on there and like everybody right. who's big in Chicago. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but I think we exchanged cards or something. He's like, yeah, in June or whatever, when the application process is open, give it a shot. So I did. And, uh, and you know, I got in. And it's awesome. Yeah. And so I've been a member ever since. And I, you know, make it a point to just, I'm constantly trying to put in the work mm-hmm. because the CFCA is a great organization. We have, you know, a couple other uh, critic bodies, you know, in Chicago now, and they're all great folks. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I try and consider is, 
that trepidation that I had of like, well, I'm not a professional in terms of getting paid by a big outlet or anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just a guy who's, you know, podcasting or writing, trying to get my opinions out there and learn as much about film as I can. Mm-hmm. I never want to rest on my laurels and be like, well, I'm in the association now. I guess I, you know, I, I can write I can relax. Review every, every couple of weeks and, you know, who cares? No, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a matter of, of pride and also not wanting to let down the colleagues that are busting mm-hmm. their asses every day and really, you know, are the cream of the crop mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you want to you want to earn the membership. In yes. 2008, I did a documentary about bloggers, film bloggers, came mm-hmm. out in 2009. At that time, the conversation was about, you know, about the blog level of writing. A lot <laughs> of a uh, lot of traditional film critics were afraid that film criticism was going to go away to be replaced by blogs so that when people said it it was blog level writing, they might, some of those people might've been, uh, you know, trying to protect, you know, it's like the new wave, you know, anyone could write film reviews, you know, some of the traditional people may have been trying to protect their turf. And, you know, I think rightfully so. I, because as much as it irked me at the time, you know, I'm, you know, 10 year, I can't do math, but (laughs) I'm almost a decade mm-hmm. on from from those rejections, and you know I do understand that everybody who's into film, you know, or film criticism thinks that they can do it and might mm-hmm. want to do it, and so there do have to be some sort of kind of standards, I think, right, to be you know to stand a, a, alongside the giants who really you know made impacts in the industry and have these reputations so i mm-hmm. i understand that's another reason that i work really hard i still don't know that i feel like i'm up to snuff mm-hmm. whatever that happens to mean but i'm you know i think putting in the work uh, and watching as many movies as you can talking to people about it and just doing the writing and doing the the podcast and the talking the thinking is is very important beyond mm-hmm. just having a website <laughs> No doubt. Yeah. And I've learned a lot by reading a lot, all kinds of film reviewers and critics. So, yeah, it's definitely an art form and it's useful. And then uh, in 2019, you just, uh, 2018, no, 2019, you discovered Werewolf Ninja Philosopher. Yeah. Well, coming up on the on the one year anniversary in a couple that's of months. Right, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And I, that's uh... introduction to slow cinema. Yeah, and I I think that's also, and you know, talking about education and and film criticism, I think you and that film really have opened things up for me. Not only because we started, you know, towards the middle to end of last year, a monthly series, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, called the slow the slow down. Yeah, on on the Kicking the Seat uh, podcast, where every month we look at a different example of slow cinema and we talk about it, and you know, you're always mentioning a movie coming out of that or like a handful That's of right. movies like oh this reminds me of this or this filmmaker you got to check out and all that so like i'm just constantly writing stuff down and 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 getting interested in this corner of the expansive film universe that i had no mm-hmm. idea existed or i did have an idea that it existed but i didn't know what exactly it was yeah, yeah. I, you would ask me so have you seen slow cinema i'm like no and i think you hand mm-hmm. me that paul schrader uh diagram right the chart and there are some filmmakers on there like oh yeah I, I know who this person is i've seen that movie i wow it's it's just more about getting to that middle where you're getting like really mm-hmm. <laughs> out there stuff um so it's it's been tremendous and i am forever grateful to you and to the werewolf ninja philosopher there you go you learn <laughs> you learned a few things thanks a lot yeah. uh yeah well yeah it's a popular art house international art house style I think uh, it being codified into slow cinema just happened over the last few years, so uh, it's uh, it's not a problem that you didn't know about it. But now you have a, it's a frame of reference. It's like uh, it's like uh, all these movies coming out of one country, but no one mentions the name of the country. Then when you find out, oh yeah, that makes sense why they're all connected. Yeah. Um, what uh, what was the big difference? I mean, what what are some of the positive things that you learned by discovering these uh, these new types of movies new to you um i think i learned patience mm-hmm. because and this is something that i think in our first conversation i confessed to that i'd watched a screener of werewolf ninja philosopher and i you know, when it got to the slow parts <laughs> right walking I, around the city 
yeah, Art is just in his werewolf makeup and he's like yeah. waiting for a train or walking down the street and you like film the full two minutes of him walking down the street and it's in slow motion with this That's kind right. of great jazzy kind of thing going on. I'm like, all right, I get it. He's walking down the street. I'll just, you know, fast forward like 15 second increments. Has anything mm -hmm. happened? Oh, no. And I keep going until there's a scene where he's talking to someone mm -hmm. realizing that, no, the whole point is to kind of get enveloped in that experience because mm -hmm. it is part of the movie. It's not yeah. like skipping through a commercial break yeah. it is the art that you're showing up for. Mm -hmm. And so now, and we'll talk about this with the Godard movie, which was really rough for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, but I committed well, to it. I, there was, there was times that I'm like, I feel like I get this. I don't, I could just turn it off and say that I watched the rest of it and I could right. probably be right. Just making stuff up. Right. No, I'm going to sit, I'm going to absorb it and try and get on that wavelength mm -hmm. um, with all of the movies that we've, we've talked about. And the thing is, it reminds me of the first time I read Irvine Welsh's Train Spotting back in 1996 because I saw Danny Boyle's film. I became obsessed with it. I found out there was a book. Mm -hmm. I bought the book. It took me almost a year to get through the first like 10 pages because it's all in this thick Scottish dialect. The American printing has an expansive dictionary in the back for all the slang. Mm -hmm. But once I got on that wavelength that I tore through the book everything else seemed really boring to me. I would read like American <laughs> fiction, you know, I'm like, where's the beauty of the language? That's right. Now watching slow cinema, I really hook into the stuff that is not that Marvel 75,000 cuts and special effects, you know, movies mm -hmm. that really mm -hmm. take their time and are really about something. Um, so that's what I have really keyed into. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think what most people think of as movies are really uh, almost like filmed plays where, uh, you know, something uh, narrative has to happen all the time, and we're used to it from from watching TV. And uh, but as being a visual art form, you could have, as you saw in many slow cinema movies, the uh, you know getting into a world and being with a character and hanging out in that world is itself a, a kind of entertainment. Yeah, very much so. And and don't get me wrong, I'm still more a fan of the traditional narrative mm -hmm. uh, of movies having stories with the yeah. a, a, B and a C I'm all for ambiguity, ambiguity and stuff. Um, but uh, I've gotten a lot more patient, I think because of, you know, my experience with slow cinema for movies that aren't, you know, they don't wear their plots on their sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. Like you loved uh, mystery train, which is a slow movie. Oh yeah. And, and, and uncle boon me and uncle you know, boon me. It's oh, awesome. Man. Yeah. All right, so let's. I'm glad you discovered that genre, and I'm glad you like Werewolf Ninja Philosopher. Let's go into uh, Godard's uh, Goodbye to Language. What did you think after you saw it, or while you were watching it? <laughs> Have you ever seen any Godard movies before? No. And, okay, well um, that that's that that that's the part of the problem. <laughs> you know, and it's it's funny because there are uh, two filmmakers that I've had this experience with before. And so I'm reluctant to talk about goodbye to language. Yeah. He's made 44 features. Yeah. I, and I know, I know Godard's a legend and, yeah. you know, is a contemporary of Truffaut and all that other stuff. Um, so I, d and I don't, having no context for it, I feel mm -hmm. trepidatious stepping into this sure. conversation. Well, just talk about your experience. Um, about halfway through, and the movie's only 70 minutes long. Right. Um, halfway through it, um, I sighed heavily. <laughs> I pressed pause. <laughs> I went upstairs and made a pot of coffee <laughs> and made a, and, and got a little bowl of Sour Patch Kids, and then I came back downstairs. <laughs> at, least, at least I didn't get a call from your wife saying, in the middle of the movie, Ian committed suicide. <laughs> No, I at least would have live streamed that to make it that, interesting. Um, but... <laughs> Godard, Godard might approve of that. <laughs> you could call it the end of cinema. No, well, there you go. Um, no, so I got through the rest of it, and I. D it's frustrating mm -hmm. because it, I can't. I constantly was thinking about Richard Linklater's Waking Life, right? Um, a movie that I adore. And a movie that I think is, is similar to this and that there's all these little snapshots of different lives being lived and kind of dropping in on conversations. And, and it's all about like the visual splendor. And mm -hmm. even though that had a 
like a 2D, like a rotoscoped animated style, but mm-hmm. there were still different art techniques being employed throughout the film. Mm-hmm. And with Godard uh, in this movie, yeah, there's, it's funny, I, the, I watched all through the end credits, mm-hmm. and it's great because the cameras, like every single one of the cameras that they used got their own like little film credit. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I don't, I didn't write any of them down, but you know, imagine like the, the, the Sony XD five L and the, you know, Atrion 60, 30 <laughs> or whatever. I'm just making stuff up, but they had that's like right. a full screen of their own credits. And awesome. I was like, yeah, that's, that makes sense for a movie like this. Um, so I appreciate the artistry and the texture, but the experience of watching the movie much like I had said before, I felt like in the beginning I could turn this off after five minutes. Mm-hmm. I could just make up what happened in the rest of the movie and mm-hmm. probably be about 90% accurate on mm. it. And yeah, I, felt I, saw... that way, I felt that way at the end of the movie. I'm like, mm-hmm. it's random images. They're well composed and shot. Um, but I don't know what I'm supposed to make of this. So I'm mm. hoping that you, if yeah. you've seen this you know, multiple times, maybe you can set me straight. But I have a feeling that if you are able to set me straight, that's just going to make me even more frustrated and mad. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I, I've seen, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, any any reaction to Godard is valid because he's he makes his own, he's almost like his own genre, right? No one makes Godard movies. And he himself has gone through multiple stages. His first movie, Breathless, if you see it, um, is it was that his first feature? Yeah. Uh, he introduced not, not the Richard Gere movie. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, his his Khan uh, uh, Fest Award winning 1960 or 59 feature Breathless introduced jump cuts. He was the he was the one who invented it and used it in a in a major motion picture. And uh, it's a detective story with jump cuts, and people were shocked by it at the time. So, and he's done things like that throughout his career. He would experiment with the form. He would change things up. And uh, in the 70s, he got into very heavily political uh, uh, movies. You know, uh, he went to a sort of he was into Marxism and all that. And then in the 80s, he came back to regular narrative filmmaking uh, with the movie called uh, uh, Every Man for Himself. Anyway, look that up. And he made a detective movie called Detective. Um, so he, he deals a lot with the form, with the messing, messing around with the form. And he's really into philosophy. He's really into French history, European history, American history. Uh, so Goodbye to Language was actually a 3D movie, which is not available for us to watch because we don't have 3D gear. But mm. uh, but when it came out, it came out as a 3D movie. And uh, one of the first 3D movies to just deal with, uh, you know, not a spectacle, just regular people and film essay type and a dog. And... Um, <laughs> It, it got really well reviewed. It won uh, in 2014. It won like the National uh, Society of Film Critics, whatever the large uh, body is. Uh, it yeah, was watered. It was watered as the best film over Richard Linklater's movie about uh, that was shot over a number of years. A uh, Boyhood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. two were competing to, for the top prize. You know, and maybe we can touch on this, but and I know it took home the the jury prize at Cannes that year. Yeah, yeah. He um, makes film essays. Essentially, his movies are, uh, I mean, but in, in Goodbye to Language, there are uh, like four different stories. But beyond that, these days, over the last 10 years or so, he makes film essays. I, you know, that may be true. But I mean, from my kind of pedestrian standpoint, essays mm-hmm. are, you know, on some level designed to make sense and convey things that mm-hmm. I, I feel like this movie I want to talk about the critical reaction to it and the awards mm-hmm. and stuff, because mm-hmm. I did look up some of that. Like, I was just curious, what's the, the Rotten Tomatoes score, the Metacritic score on this? And it's very high. It's like 88%. Like, people love this movie. Oh, okay. And, it, and before you go into that, I can explain the actual narratives that I saw. There was a, it's a stories of two couples that are very similar. Um, uh, one, you know, in the, in the beginning, uh, you see uh, like, a, like uh, someone's spouse coming and shooting someone. Like the German-speaking guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then the second story is about this one couple that lives together, and they, they, they adopt a dog. And mm-hmm. then there's a story about the dog. We see the dog wandering around, and we hear a narration. That's a third story. Then we see Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein. 
Yeah. You, rec- you recall that segment? That's yeah. the that's the that's another story. Then we hear a lot of quotes from and you know, you could watch I could watch this movie, you know, 10 times and take notes and go look up these philosophers and thinkers because uh, they're not ones that we're familiar with in the US. They uh, they must make sense more to French historians. Yeah, uh, and that's yeah, I mean I get that, but I would challenge just the idea of what we get in these movies, in, in this movie, these four kind of mm-hmm. vignettes as mm-hmm. being stories. Mm-hmm. To me, they're more like setups, like a couple adopts a dog. Mm-hmm. A dog wanders around. Mm-hmm. One couple, uh, you know, there's a shooting. Like, mm-hmm. that is the log line, maybe, or the half of a log line for a movie. Mm-hmm. Because those, just because those things happen in the course of this, I don't think necessarily adds up to a movie. And that's what's so frustrating about this. And when, I want to get back to the criticism because mm-hmm. I was looking up the, the kind of the, the zeitgeist or the, the consensus among the people who were reviewing and talking about this movie at the time. And a lot of them gave it you know, high marks for the visual splendor. They said it's as beautiful as it is inscrutable. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's half of the equation. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was describing it to my wife, uh, you know, kind of getting into, you know, just the, the higher points of what, trying to unravel what I saw, she said, mm-hmm. it sounds like one of those movies that's playing on a broken black and white TV in the middle of an art installation that's just mm-hmm. like a big gray room that you walk past. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's like a fake pretentious movie Mm -hmm. and i felt like i needed context or a history lesson in godard to get anything out of this Mm -hmm. and i do not respond positively to those kinds of movies i shouldn't Mm -hmm. need like all of the context in -hmm. order to sit down and appreciate it on on some kind of level because yeah i understand there's the mary Mary shelley stuff i saw the stuff with the shooting and all that but i'm watching it and i know that these pieces came back sort of thematically throughout the film and i saw the the quotes from the philosophy i'm like yeah i i know solzhenitsyn Mm -hmm. um and i know that there's a lot of talk about hitler and you know fascism and all of this other stuff but i don't know why i'm listening to this well there's in in waking life right waking life and this is why i think link later did a better job or at least possibly a more commercial job with indie sensibilities Mm -hmm. is i can watch that and I can see Alex Jones ranting in a police car about you know whatever he's talking about, uh, but get a, a sense of who that character is and what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see the vignette where I think it's the the violinists like warming up before practice and understand what I'm looking at and how that fits into the larger story. Mm-hmm. This was just like crazy MTV style editing with very beautiful graphics mm-hmm. that don't add up to much you said you've watched this movie a number of okay, times so was, and taken it, notes i can't see watching this movie again frankly mm-hmm. unless i do something similar to what i did with a couple other filmmakers which i want to get into uh later mm-hmm. so okay so we understand that you had a hard time with it so the uh the title is goodbye to language so one of the preoccupations with uh in that movie in this in this film essay that godard made is uh, and this is one of the things that many French, fr- apparently French philosophy is occupied with in the past, which is uh, le- how language makes life difficult for humans, how it separates people from each other and how it separates humans from the uh, w- uh, from existence in, in the world. So uh, the uh, seeing the dog going about its life, lo- the dog doesn't have its own language like we do. So uh, that's maybe Godard is saying that's a, that's a way of living that is uh, closer to nature and that's something maybe that's good. Uh, well, and, and I got, I did get that because yeah. there was, I, I don't know if I wrote it down because I wrote down some of the actual dialogue passages from there, but I do understand what you're saying, what Godard was saying about that language barrier. Problem, yeah. But that's the thing is, Personally, I don't I don't agree with that, and I mm-hmm. don't see language as a problem that separates people. Mm-hmm. So I see it. if I'm watching a movie that has that as its premise, mm-hmm. not even if I agreed with it, I want to see more. Like mm-hmm. I could just if I could make a movie in which the theme is I just keep popping in and saying life is meaningless, people are stupid, mm-hmm. you know everything is dumb. Mm-hmm. That's not a thesis, and it's not interesting. Like mm-hmm. all it is is like you know it's it's something I might scribble in the back of my high school notebook. Mm-hmm. But you know if you get varying perspectives or at least 
explain to an audience member who might not agree with you mm -hmm. why you understand the world that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt like I spent 70 minutes watching someone ramble without actually getting to the point of whatever they're trying to say. And mm -hmm. worse than that, I'm not interested in what they have to say because mm -hmm. I feel like it's limited. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult movie and it requires. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean. There's no one way films have to be. I mean, if some people don't get it, that's fine. If some people hate it, that's fine. So sure, and, and I understand that. But and this is this is a problem I had with two other filmmakers, uh, yeah. Dario Argento and Terrence Malick. Mm -hmm. um, I watched their later films. My first Dario Argento movie was uh, was Dracula 3D. Mm -hmm. um, and my I first Terrence. Uh, hmm. um, <laughs> and my my first Terrence Malick movie was I think I saw two of them. They're both his later, you know, within the last five years, he was making really weird out there stuff. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see Badlands. That was like my third or Badlands fourth Badlands was really good, now. yeah. And I finally, when I watched Badlands, I'm like, okay, now I understand why people give a shit about Terrence Malick. Mm -hmm. When I watched, you know, I went through, I've been going through a, a two or three year project watching Dario Argento movies, you know, from the beginning of his career, not the very end, mm -hmm. to and I finally get Dario Argento, and so I'm going to come back to Dracula 3D and see, you know, is it just trash or was there something in there that I just wasn't getting into because I didn't understand the Argento language? Mm -hmm. With Godard, he's a legendary filmmaker, is very inf influential and important, mm -hmm. but I don't get that from watching this movie. Mm -hmm. And so my fear is with a lot of these influential filmmakers later in their career when they're just, you know, I'm, I'll just say it fucking around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Younger people like film students are like, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to watch Godard. And then you show that's them not, this that's movie. That's not what's going on. That's not what's going on. Well, because... but no, I'm, I'm, but what I'm saying is mm -hmm. it's kind of like Stan Lee said, everybody's, every comic book is somebody's first comic book. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to show someone this film, you have to assume that there's going to be someone who wanders in off the street and watches this movie mm -hmm. and says, oh, this is that Godard guy everyone talks about. Cool. Yeah. This movie might per dissuade me from True. watching anything that he's ever done. <laughs> anything yeah, else. No. But we're not trying to sell something, and it's not a popularity contest. As a film it's, critic... It's, it's, it's not even about that, necessarily. It's just... Yeah. And I'm not trying to fault Godard. I'm just saying, as someone who's watched him, uh, or, or watched a piece of his work and yeah. even one that's highly regarded if everyone if the consensus is that he's an important legendary filmmaker that critics love mm -hmm. if this is an example of something that critics love mm -hmm. that you know that he did mm -hmm. i don't I, i'm very trepidatious to go back and say well if everyone loves this mm -hmm. and i think this is terrible I'm skeptical about the other stuff that people quote unquote love. So mm -hmm. my point, which I never quite finished earlier when I was looking up the critical consensus, because I'm like, well, I don't think this is very good. Maybe other people are on that wavelength and they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is not top form Godard. The consensus was, yeah, it's pretty great. I wonder, do they really feel that way? Or is it because it's Godard as a brand? You said he's not selling anything, but he kind of doesn't have to, mm -hmm. you know, at a certain point, it is the name. You're going to see the new Godard. Yeah, he's an artist. Have, right. Yeah. But, you know, is it possible for him to make something that is not very good that people will think is really good because it's the guy? And mm -hmm. if that's the case, then how do you know if he's actually made something that is not worthy of the Godard name? Well, you have to go with how you feel about it. You have to take a look at it and, and take a look at it and see if you understand it. And uh, if you personally haven't seen, without having seen any other Godard movies, don't like this movie, that's a completely valid reaction because it's a, it can be a confusing movie. There's a lot happening in it. And like I said, this is a movie that if I had nothing else to do and I was, you know, vacationing somewhere, I would watch this and take notes and look up what he was talking about because there's a lot of thinkers that are being quoted that I and I'm not very familiar with. So, as a in, as an introduction to those people, I mean, there's some interesting quotes in there. I would I would look it up. But uh, for me, what I got from the movie was that it's, it was an interesting experience. That uh, you know about two couples and a dog, and uh, and visually even 2D as like a visual essay. I thought it was interesting. The like the like the really blurred, rich the the, the blue imagery. Do you recall when they're driving? 
Sure. I mean, but, I, 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 but that's the thing. I didn't see anything in this movie that I haven't seen in other movies. OK, got it. Right. There's there's nothing. I mean, and we're talking about 2014. So it's hard for me to recall if what I saw was in that interim period or if it was before. Maybe the people and films I'm thinking of were influenced by this. I can't tell. Mm -hmm. But as lovely as the images were, there was nothing that really grabbed me, except to say that this movie made nudity boring, mm -hmm. which I didn't think was possible. I mean, at, I've at seen a certain that point, I'm like, I'm like please, please, please put your clothes back on. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you watched many film essays? No, and you keep using this term film essay. I don't it's know a, exactly what, you're, what, what you mean in that context. When I it's, think film essay, I mean, I, I feel like I'm thinking of uh, movies – <laughs> like essays that use the language of film to make a point. No. But, okay, uh, it, film, educate me. Yeah, film essays are a genre of movies. They became very popular over the last 10 years. Uh, yeah, uh, I've heard of them. I just don't know that I've... And yeah, again, yeah. like with slow yeah, cinema, maybe I have seen them before. I just didn't know what I was looking at. So what what is a film essay? Yeah, so uh, in a film essay, unlike the Godard movie, which is very confusing, uh, like someone would do a film essay which is a video essentially uh, on let's say Terrence Malick, right? They would go into, they would show clips uh, of Malick movies. They would talk about the underlying themes, how they connect together. It's basically one uh, use of film essays is to introduce someone to a new artist. So yeah. in your, in your case, if you Google film essay Godard, someone probably made a film essay about, why Godard does what he what he does, what it means, and why it might be relevant. So, okay, so I, I have seen film essays before. Yes. Um, yes. So this so this That's is what I thought. So how is this a film essay? What is what is it saying? So it's it's Godard's uh, film essay on uh, the relationship between uh, on multiple things: the relationship between language and humans, language and history, because he. Apparently, either Europe or he, he himself or maybe the entire world, in his view, was heavily affected by the World War II experience, the Nazis. Mm -hmm. So he keeps going back to that. So this is and this is unlike the other film essays, which are more like documentaries, where they clearly want you to understand what's going on. This is more of a creative film essay of, let's say, like in experimental films where it's just shapes, like uh, shapes and colors. So mm -hmm. there's there's an uh, like uh, like um, yeah just Google experimental films non narrative experimental films so there's a whole school of that uh, of uh, I, there's one filmmaker that I'm trying to think of now but I, uh, his name is not popping up so I see uh, Goodbye to Language as Godard uh, focusing on one theme the relationship between language and humans but looking at it from multiple different perspectives. From the perspective of a dog, from this, uh, from the perspective of two, you know, two couples that are who are kind of similar, from the historical perspective. Um, but what I what I think I'll do is I'll get more into it and I'll write a sort of a guide to you know this movie, maybe a little one, maybe I'll do a separate podcast on it. But there, yeah, so so the brief answer is this is Godard's very creative film essay on. Uh, humans and language that's that well i could leave it at that i understand that that's what you think this is and i understand mm -hmm. that that might be what he intended it and maybe what other people consider it to be mm -hmm. but you know what again when i think of an essay i think of as you mentioned with the video essay mm -hmm. um tackling a subject and explaining to the people watching you know a point of view Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what this is. I think there are ideas and like, well, I would say like slivers of ideas mm -hmm. because saying, yeah, the world was messed up because of World War II, no shit. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not an essay. That's, you know, that's a brief, pithy statement of fact. Mm -hmm. Why are we talking about Hitler in 2014? Um, you, you can almost make a, a better case to be talking about in 2016 or 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but just saying, yeah, I'm French and the Nazis and look, there's someone shooting people in the, you know, in the town square, or whatever, but there's no context for it. Mm -hmm. That's a bunch of like kind of ideas, uh, vignettes, images in search of a reason to be put on film. Mm -hmm. So 
I can't really agree. I'm, I'm just going to say I don't agree that it's an essay. Mm-hmm. I'm probably totally wrong because it's been classified, quote unquote, as an essay. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm just not impressed. I, I think That's there, cool. are ide- there are ideas to explore there. I just don't know that Godard is the one to do it. Again, it looks great, but as mm-hmm. something that is supposed to be absorbed. I, the fact that you're saying maybe I'll write a guide to this movie mm-hmm. indicates to me that it's a failure as anything but a visual experience. No, no, but you're you're thinking of success and failure and the right way and the wrong way to do it. But just think of someone who's doing a painting about history, right? Uh, let's say, I mean, it, it's not it's not really a history lesson. It's more of a impressionistic take on actual events it depends i mean it, because you know as a trained you know, artist who studied mm-hmm. art history and techniques i agree with what you're saying mm-hmm. however if as in you know like the kind of the modern art movement you could say here are two parallel lines on a canvas mm-hmm. and it's meant to represent napoleon's inner struggle as he you know was watching the walls crumble around him at waterloo you know mm-hmm. it's that kind of pretentious stuff where more thought went into the artist's statement about the piece than mm-hmm. the actual work. And that's mm-hmm. something that we've kind of touched on this in, in our previous conversation, mm-hmm. which is probably an, an entire series of chats about art and, you know, successful and, <laughs> and mm-hmm. non-successful art from different points of view. Mm-hmm. We don't need to get into here, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I just don't happen to agree. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, not everything is for everyone, but uh, now you can say at least you've seen one Godard movie. And I'm anxious, despite what I've said, and it's because of the Malik and Argento experiences, mm-hmm. I do want to go back and watch earlier Godard to find, just to get on that wavelength, maybe see stuff that is a bit more, uh, to use the word traditional or something mm-hmm. that I can hook into a bit easier, and then maybe come back to this and be like, oh yeah, I totally, yeah, this is <laughs> this makes this makes complete sense. I don't know what within, I was thinking. Within the context of Godard, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah because. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if you uh, yeah, I mean, check out uh, Breathless. Check out uh, uh, every uh, yeah yeah. I mean, you could you can look it up. I mean, the earlier stuff is I think uh, oh, Contempt is another one that people quote from the early days. Weekend. I think like the first ten years, he made movies that were he was kind of forced to make by producers because they were funding it. He was kind of forced to make movies that resemble regular movies that could be sold in theaters. So you might be able to get into those well, or it not. Almost or like, not. Like, it sounds almost like the Malik trajectory, mm-hmm. you know, where the last few years he's been getting like really kind of experimental and, and out there, even though he's using big name like mainstream studio movie stars, which I mm-hmm. think is part of the commentary if he's trying to make one, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. So I don't know. Did, but you yeah, see, that, did you see the most recent Malik movie where it was a World War II store? No, I didn't. I think yeah. I have a. I think I had a screener for it, but I, I didn't watch it. Yeah, that's supposed to be really good. It's about uh, someone who resisted the Nazis in Germany and was killed for it. Is that the one that came out last year, or is there was there another yeah. one? Yeah, it okay, came yeah. out 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've heard good things about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and, and it's not supposed to be experimental. I mean, it's the storytelling method is more formal. Yeah. I mean, more regular. So. There you go. You've seen the Godard movie. So what do you have coming up on your shows, on your podcast? Uh, well, I'm talking about the, I mentioned it before, the new Scooby-Doo movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about the movie Better Off Dead, uh, which is, because uh, my, my wedding anniversary is coming up on Friday, mm-hmm. and it's the movie that my wife and I, we kind of bonded over, and we actually themed our wedding after. It's a awesome. 1985 John Cusack kind of absurd comedy uh, mm-hmm. So it'll be good to, to revisit that and talk about it with my millennial correspondent, Cole, who nice. uh, one of our series is each month we talk about a movie that he's never seen because he grew up reading books instead of watching movies. So mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of the fundamentals he's he's catching up on. So that's a lot of fun. So I'm anxious for him to see that movie and see if he ever talks to me again. Awesome. And then we yeah. have something coming up in June. And, uh, uh, which I still have to I, I owe you a, a schedule because we've got a few shows to talk about in the next couple sure. of months. And with your busy podcasting schedule, I think we're, we're talking about uh, Dune in June. Is that right? June, uh, either that or maybe Breakthrough Weekend. I don't know. That doesn't rhyme. Um, OK. I <laughs> know <laughs> uh, we were. Uh, yeah, you sent me a list and I, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah, whatever we have, we'll figure right. it out. Okay. Yeah, Dune is interesting. That's an interesting uh, David Lynch movie. Um, yeah. 
I'm awesome. excited. All right. Hope you had a good time. I had a great time. I, I hope I, I wasn't uh, annoying or embarrassing. No, no, no. Time. You're fine. I mean, it's a, <laughs> yeah, Godard moves are very difficult. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people, someone not liking or thinking Godard is pretentious, that's the norm. I think that's the, <laughs> I think that's the, that's the response he elicits from most people. Uh, I was talking to my girlfriend, Amanda, about the title, Goodbye to Language. She's like, uh, it should be called Hello to Pretentiousness. <laughs> She's a keeper. Um. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, it's good art. Pretentiousness is, is a given. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because, yeah, that was my reaction. But, you know, maybe there's something in there uh, in the earlier filmography that That'll... even if it is pretentious, may... I have no problem with be... with pretentiousness right. necessarily. <laughs> It's just got to be my brand of pretentiousness. It's just got to make sense somehow. Yeah. If yes. you if you see the earlier movies, you might be like, oh, this is what he's doing 40 years down the road, warped up, you know, on hyperdrive. Yeah. Excellent. All right. I'll put this up in a couple hours or tomorrow morning. I'll send you the link. Awesome. Thanks man. for coming well, on the show. You. All Good right. Show. Thank you. All, <laughs> All right. Man. Talk to you Have soon. Have a great night. See All you right. in Bye. Chicago. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. See you. Stay safe.